the um, public speaking experts tell us that you should never apologise before a talk. Um, so we'll, we'll call this an explanation, not an apology. But when, I think it was in our last elders meeting, um, Ros or Pastor Peter, one of them, um, asked if any of the elders were going to be here on either of the Sabbaths of Big Camp because they knew we'd be very light on, on numbers and light on elders and everyone else, obviously. Um, but it's good to see so many here. Um, and I, I said, yeah, I think we'll be here the first Sabbath of camp. We're going next Sabbath to camp. Um, so I, I can do the service, if you like, on that first Sabbath. And I, I had no idea when I volunteered for that and when I prepared this that um, this was Easter. So you're not going to get an Easter sermon today, um, an Easter program. And I think you'd probably worked out from the, choice, the song choices we had um, that my theme today is prayer. Um, and prayer is important any day of the year, isn't it? Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about prayer. Man has been described as a praying animal. In fact, it's man's ability to communicate with his maker that sets him apart from the rest of creation. And I've been thinking a little bit of, a lot about prayer lately uh, with some of the things that are happening in the world around us and um, some of the things that uh, some of our own church family here are suffering with. Um, I've thought a lot about prayer and answered prayer and what I want to share with you today is nothing new or profound, um, rather just some thoughts, some observations if you like on prayer, some from my own experience and some from the experience of others in prayer. And so it seems appropriate before we start that we should pray, so let's bow our heads. Father, as we share some time together this morning, as we um, share some stories and some thoughts, some guidance from your word on prayer, we ask that you will um, be here with us, guide our thoughts, um, make us receptive to your message, give me words to speak, and may we, Father, leave this place today knowing that we have come to know and understand and love you a little more. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. No doubt um, many of you, like me, when you were uh, children, read Mark Twain's book, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. And there's an interesting... Um, part in this story where Huck Finn actually talks about prayer, his ideas about prayer. I'm going to read to you just a little of what he says. Miss Watson, she took me in the closet and prayed, but nothing come of it. She told me to pray every day and whatever I asked for I would get it, but it weren't so. I tried it. Once I got a fish line, but no hooks. It weren't any good to me with no hooks. I tried for hooks three or four times, but somehow I couldn't make it work. By and by one day, I asked Miss Watson to try for me, but she said I was a fool. She never told me why, and I couldn't make it out no way. I sat down one time back in the woods and had a long think about it. I says to myself, if a body can get anything they pray for, why don't Deacon Wynne get back the money he lost? Why can't the widow get back her silver snuff box that was stole? Why can't Miss Watson fat up? No, I says to myself, there ain't nothing in it. Have you ever felt like Huck Finn? And I'm not talking about fishing lines and hooks here. I'm talking about the really important things. You've prayed for a sick relative and she died. You've prayed to get out of debt only to sink in deeper. You've prayed for health and, and become sick. You've prayed for your children and they've rebelled and turned away from God. You've prayed for guidance and heard only silence. If everyone who had had one of these experiences would shout amen, the sound would echo around the world. So is Huck Finn right when it comes to prayer? Is there nothing in it? Before you decide, listen to this story. Uh, some of you know that I spent um, several years, seven, seven years, 
teaching in the highlands of New Guinea in the early in the 1980s. And um, I was teaching at Carbufa High School, about 10 kilometres out out of Garoka in the Eastern Highlands. And a friend of mine was um, running the layman's training school at Homu, which was I don't know, I guess another 40, 45 minutes the other side of Garoka, uh, on the slopes of Mount Michael. And Many of you too, are, I'm sure, have heard, are aware from things you've heard on the news and read in the record and things like that, of some of the, um, the problems, that, in law and order problems, that they're facing in New Guinea. Um, and it wasn't much different back then, although I think it's probably worse now than when I was there. Um, with these rascal gangs, as they call them. And one of the... I guess if you live in Ley or Port Moresby or some of the bigger towns and cities, um, you know, they will just break into your home, whether you're there or not, uh, with guns and, and um, rob you. Um, but in the more remote areas, one of the methods they use is to drop a tree. They'll cut down a tree and drop it across the road or drag a log across the road to, to create a roadblock. And when you drive along, come around a corner and here's this log across the road in front of you and um, you have no option to stop. And by the time you ha can, before you can have time to turn around or get out of the car and try and drag the log off the road or whatever to get through, you're surrounded. Um, I've had this happen to me once when I was up there, but luckily we, um, they were a fairly, fairly new at the game, I think, and they weren't uh, particularly professional. And um, we did what a lot of expats do up there and carried a, spare wallet, a, a second wallet, just had a few keener in it and we gave them these few keener out of this wallet and they were happy and off they went. Um, but it wasn't always like that simple and um, as I said a friend of mine um, was work, running the layman's school at Homu and he was on his way home from, from town one day, had his eight year old, eight, yeah I guess she would have been about eight at the time, had his eight-year-old daughter in the car with him and he came around a corner and here's this log across the road and he knew what it meant. So he pulled up and before he could do anything this car was surrounded by these men that ran out of the bush armed with bush knives and bows and arrows and, and um, he sat there in the car and said a quick prayer that God would protect them. The apparent leader of the gang came to the driver's door and ordered Doug out of the car and Liz, his daughter, went to, to get out of the car too and this man said, no, you stay there. And this is when Doug really got worried um, and thought they're, they're going to try and take the car um, and take Liz with them as well. Um, so again, he prayed. He got out of the car and um, the ringleader of this gang got in the car, the keys were still in, in the ignition, Doug had switched the car off, and he went to try and went to start the car, and it wouldn't start. In fact, it was completely dead. Wouldn't even, the engine wouldn't even turn over. And he tried over and over again and couldn't get the car to start, and by this stage he was get, it was taking longer than they'd expected, and he was getting pretty angry. And um, they went through the car and took what they could find, of any value and um, again he got he tried to start the car and it wouldn't start and um, they're starting to get a bit agitated at this stage with it taking this long and then one of the rascal gang called out cars cars you could hear cars coming and um, then one of them said police and apparently he thought he heard police sirens and um, and so these these, ra these rascals ran off into the back into the bush. Doug hopped back in his in the car in the driver's seat, turned the ignition, and the car started first time. Um, luck, coincidence, or divine intervention? You decide. Um, I know what I believe, and I know what Doug believed. This was an answer to prayer, pure and simple. Um, by the way, it took Doug time to move this log off the road and get going and, and by the time he left, no other cars had turned up. There weren't any other cars, there weren't any police cars. Now, 
I don't know, did God put the, the sound of those cars and those sirens in these people's ears? I don't know. Um, so who is right? Is Huck Finn right? Is there nothing in it? Is prayer simply a phenomenon in which those people praying convince themselves, fool themselves into believing that someone has heard, that someone is listening? Or is my friend Doug right? Does prayer make a difference? Is God listening? And if so, does he act? For those blessed with faith, there is no doubt. Doug's was an answered prayer, pure and simple. But how, how do the faithful know that God answers their prayers? How do we prove it? That's, I've thought about this a bit, and it's, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Um, we might believe that something is an answer to prayer from God, but it's hard to convince other people of that. I say, oh, that's just coincidence, just luck. Um, and I've decided that it really depends on your point of view. If you believe, no proof is necessary. If you don't believe, no amount of proof is going to be sufficient to, to convince you. There is ample evidence in both the Old and New Testaments that God hears and answers prayer. In fact, if we leave out the book of Psalms, which is a prayer book in itself, there are apparently uh, some 650 recorded prayers in the Bible, to which there are at least 450 recorded answers. Nehemiah knew there was power in prayer. I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah was a, a man of prayer. And I'm sure we're all familiar with the story how Nehemiah ended up um, in the court of, uh, of the king as a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes in, in Persia. And um, verse 2 Well, the second part of verse 1 that starts tells us that um, when I was in the, the palace at Shushan, one of my fellow Jews named Hanani came to visit me with some men who had arrived from Judah. I took the opportunity to, in, opportunity to inquire how things were going in Jerusalem. And the answer Nehemiah got was not a good one. They said, verse 3, Things are not good. The wall in Jerusalem is still torn down and the gates are buried. What did Nehemiah do? He yes. He prayed. Tells us in um, verse 4, When I heard this, I sat down. He cried, actually. He wept. He says, I sat down and cried, but he also prayed. I refused to eat for several days, for I spent the time in prayer to the God of heaven. And in verse 5, oh, sorry, verse 6, it says, Hear my prayer, listen carefully to what I say, look down and see me praying night and day. And then again in verse 11, O Lord, please hear my prayer. Heed the prayers of those who delight to honour you. Please help me now as I go in and ask the king for a great favour. Put it in his heart to be kind to me. And we find then Nehemiah going into the king as... He obviously did it regularly. Uh, he was the king's cupbearer. Um, but there must have been something different about his countenance. And the king obviously knew Nehemiah quite well. And Nehemiah was obviously normally a very cheerful and happy person, despite the, the circumstances of, of their captivity. Um, because the king noticed the difference, noticed that Nehemiah was sad. And he says in, um, in chapter 2, Verse 1, I was serving the king his wine and he asked me, why so sad? You aren't sick, are you? You look like a man with deep troubles. And this gave Nehemiah the opportunity he was waiting for. And what did Nehemiah do again? Verse 
He prayed. Verse 4 says, well, the king asked him what should be done. Um, Nehemiah explains that why he's sad, that his city is in ruins. Um, and the king says, what should be done? And it, in the second part of verse 4, it says, with a quick prayer to God, to the God of heaven, I replied. What a time to, to stop and pray, standing there in the presence of the king. The king's asked you a question, waiting for an answer. But Nehemiah took the time to stop and pray. With a quick prayer to, God, to the God of heaven, I replied, If it please your majesty, and if you look upon me with your royal favour, send me to Judah to rebuild the city of my fathers. The king replied, How long will you be gone? And it goes on to tell us that um, Nehemiah also asked for um, letters of introduction to, to the kings of the different places he'd passed through along the way to get him through safely, um, to the governors of the different um, provinces and so on. And he also asked for a letter um, to the manager of the king's forest, instructing him to give Nehemiah all the timber that he needed for the reconstruction and so on. And verse 8, it tells us, And the king granted these requests, for God was being gracious to me. Yes, Nehemiah was a man of prayer. Another man of prayer in a, a different era, a man who um, the more I read about, the more I admire, was President Ab Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln was a, a tr true believer in prayer. And the story is told, of a, of told by a visitor uh, to the White House during the Civil War. And this man was staying at the White House for three weeks. Um, and one night during this stay at the White House, this visitor had, was very restless. He had a restless night and was having trouble sleeping. And he got up early before dawn and decided to go for a walk. And he... He got dressed and walked quietly down the, the hallway so as not to wake anyone. And as he walked down the hallway, he heard a voice coming from a private room where the president slept. He says, instinctively, I looked in. The door was partly open. He said, instinctively, he looked in and he said, there I saw a sight I shall never forget. It was the president of the United States kneeling before an open Bible. The light was turned low in the room. His back was toward me. I shall never forget his tones, so piteous and so sorrowful. O thou God, who heard Solomon in the night when he prayed and cried for wisdom, hear me. I cannot lead this people. I cannot guide the affairs of this nation without thy help. I am poor and weak and sinful. O God, thou didst hear Solomon when he cried for wisdom. Hear me and save this nation. I can't help but think what a different world we might have if um, we had more presidents and prime ministers and world leaders today who spent more time on their knees seeking God's guidance in the running of the affairs of their country and of the world. Um, Abe Lincoln, quite a contrast to the man who's currently in the White House, isn't it? Mm. Um, but you know, if we think about it, I'm sure there are times in all our lives when we believe that God has given us a direct answer to prayer. I think of one of my earliest experiences. Um, I was eight years old, I think, and um, one night my mum got very sick and was rushed to hospital. Um, and the, the doctors told Dad that he should bring us kids in and say our goodbyes because they, he didn't, they didn't expect Mum was going to make it through the night. And I don't know how because Dad, Dad's not an, Dad wasn't and never was an Adventist, um, but somehow someone got the message to someone at the, at the Inverell Church, which was our home church, um, and they did a ring around and a group of church members met at the at the church and had a, an all-night, basically, prayer session um, for mum. And next morning, 
the doctor came to, to check on mum, not expecting her really to still be there, and she was much better. In fact, she was up and around, and um, he couldn't explain it. In, in, in medical terms, he, he didn't know what had happened, he couldn't explain it. Um, but we could. We knew it was an answer to prayer. And I've often wondered, you know, why did, why did God choose to save mum that night um, when others he doesn't always? Um, maybe it was because, you know, Dad wasn't an Adventist and we had, there were three young children who maybe God knew would not go to church any longer if, um, if mum wasn't there. I don't know. Um, but God did answer our prayer and mum lived for another what 40 odd years I suppose after that um, some of you may remember another little uh, illustration some of you may remember Narelle Nelson um, came to church here for a while she was um, colleague I taught with at Blue Hills College and um, I didn't know Narelle until she came to the school and one one day she was at our place and she was telling us the story of how she actually came to be employed at the school and it was a really interesting story and she was um, she's a qualified teacher but she wasn't teaching at the time she was living in Melbourne and she was working in a family business um, and things went bad for the business. So I think, I um, can't remember all the details, but I think um, they were ripped off by a, a, a customer or um, a client um, and they had to close the business and she lost her money that had been invested in the business. She lost her job and um, was suddenly unemployed. Um, one day she, after all this happened, she found herself in the ABC and she's not sure why she went there because she said she knew she had no money to buy anything but she was just filling in some time I guess and um, having a look around and she picked up a Bible and started looking through it and she she'd been wanting a new Bible for a while and um, she sort of had this feeling you know, yeah you should buy this Bible and she put it out of her head and said don't be silly you, if you buy this today you're not going to be able to buy groceries and um, for the next week um, and she kept wandering but she kept getting this feeling in her this idea in her head you should buy that Bible and she she said a prayer to God and said you know um, if you if this is you God if you really want me to buy this Bible you need to make work it out so that I can pay my rent and buy the groceries for the next week or two um, until I get more money so she went ahead and bought this Bible, not sure why. When she got home, she, she checked her phone and there was a message on her phone to ring the North New South Wales conference, and a, and a name there that she didn't know. Um, she rang this number and it was the education director at the conference uh, asking if she was interested in a job at Blue Hills College. She'd never heard of Blue Hills College at this stage. In fact, it wasn't Blue Hills College, and then it was still Blue Hills Adventist School, I think. But um, she took the job. Again, um, she believes very strongly that that was an answer to prayer, um, that God was working it out all along before she even understood what was going on. But one of the great problems in asking God for a favour, for any favour, is that he may not grant it. And when he, when he um, appears to answer some people's prayers and not others, it may appear that he's playing favourites. Is God unjust? The question is as old as the book of Job, and believers have been wrestling ever since with the answer God gives there. Who has a claim against me that I must pay? Remember we said that there are some 650 prayers recorded in the Bible to which there are at least 450 answers recorded. Do the maths. Doesn't add up, does it? Does that mean that on the other 200 occasions God didn't answer, didn't hear or didn't answer their prayers? 
that he said no? Again, I'm sure there have been times in all our lives when we have not received an answer to a prayer, or at least not the answer we wanted. And the vision of a God who is able to act but won't can be unsettling. I mentioned before um, the story, Doug's story, at, who, who, when he was the um, running the layman's training school at Garoka, at Tomu, outside Garoka. When Doug, uh, some of you will, I'm sure, will remember the story of Peter Canopper. Um, Peter was the one who replaced Doug at Homu. Um, when Doug, Doug was called to be um, district director at um, Kundiawa, Peter Canopper was called to replace Doug at the layman's training school. One night, as he did every night, because they, they weren't on power, didn't have power there, of course they had a, a diesel generator. One night, at, before they went to bed, Peter went outside to turn off the generator as he did every night and his wife Sherry heard a, a loud bang. It sounded like a gunshot but she didn't know whether it was a gunshot or whether something had gone wrong with the generator and it had blown up or whatever. Um, and as scared as she was, she knew she had to go outside and check. So she found the torch, went outside in the darkness looking around with the torch and she found Peter lying on the ground. Um, basically with half his head blown away from a, a gunshot. Um, he was still breathing and she didn't know what to do. She got the car. She, um, Peter's a very, was a big guy and she was, she's only a very frail little thing. Um, but somehow she managed to get him into the front seat of the Hilux, got her three little girls into the back seat and she knew she just had to try and get him to town. Um, so, in the pitch black, on this dangerous road at night, with Peter's head resting on her lap, she drove the 40 minutes into Garoka to take him to the hospital. Um, he didn't make it. Um, the next day, I did one of the hardest things I've ever had to do, I think. Um, I drove into Garoka to the mission, host, mission headquarters where um, Sherry was staying and I sat down with her and she said to me, she said, Rob, I knew the exact minute he went. She said, I, I, I felt it. But she said, I couldn't do anything. What could I do but keep driving? And I, I don't know, I, I struggle with that. I struggle with it for a long time. Because I, I think, you know, why were, why were they up there in the first place? They were there doing God's work, weren't they? They were there because God called them there and they were doing, doing his work. So why did God let this happen? I don't know. I don't have all the answers. I can probably say this now because it's been a long time, um, but soon after Peter's funeral, I came home and I, was, I went to church in Lismore and I was <laughs> sitting in Lismore church and they were having a, a sermon, that, a program that day on prayer. And I won't mention any names, but um, they, it, it was interesting. They, they, during the sermon, they were getting different people up to tell their experiences in, with, their, with answered prayer and so on. And the, as I said, I won't mention any names, but the minister's wife got up and she was telling the story of how, I forget where they were, but they were working at a, ministering at a church here in the, on the mainland and they had a call to Tasmania and she didn't want to go to Tasmania. She loved the home they were in where they were and didn't want to leave it and go to Tassie. Um, and... She said she prayed about it and she said she asked God, she said, if you want, really want me to, us to go to Tassie, 
find us a house with water views and listed off these things. And she said, and God answered our prayers. The first house they showed us when we went to Hobart was this beautiful place looking over the water. And you know, I know God, God's interested in the little things in our lives too, but at the time when I'd just come back from New Guinea and from Peter's funeral, knowing what had happened up there, this sort of got to me a little bit. You know, um, here they are worrying about little things like water views. Um, and I'm sure Peter and Sherry prayed every morning for God's protection throughout the day. And look what happened. And I just couldn't sort of reconcile the two. And as I said, I struggled with this for a long, long time. And as I said, I don't have all the answers. But I do know one thing. I have to trust God, even when I don't get the answer I want. There was a very interesting article um, on prayer in the Reader's Digest a few years ago. A funny place to have a, find an article on prayer, maybe. But um, it told the story of Gary Habermas, a professor of philosophy, I think, yes, um, who considered himself by belief and by habit a man of prayer. In fact, he kept a list of names, um, and at any given time there were uh, over 100 names on this list of people he prayed for, some of whom he didn't even know. And over the years he saw some remarkable answers to prayer. And so when in 1996, I think it was, 1995, when his wife of 23 years was diagnosed with cancer, he prayed more earnest, earnestly than he ever had that God would save her, would heal her. By one measure, he failed. His wife died. But before she died, she told her husband, God spoke to me three words, I love you. Abamas was torn between grief and gratitude. You see, he says, my wife had doubted God's love for her for the, for the whole 23 of, three years of our married life. Yet now she was as sure of his love as she was of mine. Did Gary's prayer go unanswered? He didn't get what he wanted, did he? God didn't save his wife. There and then for maybe another 20 or 30 years of this life, but he did something even greater. He saved her for eternity. Sometimes maybe God gives us what we need rather than what we want or think we need. I don't like the notion that when we pray and don't get answers, God has considered our request and said no. Maybe what he's saying is, not yet, wait a while. Or maybe he's saying, I have something even better in store for you. You often hear parents um, of young children when the kids might be playing in another room or something and it's too quiet and they'll say, I don't like this, it's too quiet, they must be up to something. Um, I like to think of God like that. When we, when we think we're not getting an answer, when we're not hearing from him, when we think he's silent, I like to think that it's too quiet. Maybe God's up to something. He's working on something. If there's one thing I've learned through my experiences, it's that I can trust God to have a good answer to my prayer. But that's not the same thing as knowing what that answer will be. Prayer, after all, is not some, some kind of magic formula to get God to give me what I want. That was how Huck Finn saw prayer, wasn't it? It's a rather immature view of prayer. Christians don't pray because God is doing nothing. They pray because they desire to see God work more powerfully. Prayer opens the channels of God's blessing. It was Archbishop Trench who said, Lord, what a change within us one short hour spent in thy presence makes. We kneel 
how weak. We rise, how full of power. And speaking of the power of prayer, listen to this quote. The spectacle of a nation praying is more awe-inspiring than the explosion of an atomic bomb. The force of prayer is greater than any possible combination of man-made or man-controlled powers because prayer is man's greatest means of trapping the infinite resources of God. Powerful, isn't it? Would anyone like to hazard a guess as who wrote that? You'll never guess unless... I actually used that quote for a praise service once a little while back, so someone may remember. Um, I'll read it once more. The spectacle of a nation praying is more awe-inspiring than the explosion of an atomic bomb. The force of prayer is greater than any possible combination of man-made or man-controlled forces because prayer is man's greatest means of trapping the infinite resources of God. Any guesses as to who wrote that? You'll never guess. No. No. J. Edgar Hoover, former director of the FBI. Powerful statement, isn't it? The main purpose of prayer is to communicate with an all-powerful personal God. Prayer is first and foremost communication. It's fellowship with the God who made us. In the communion of prayer, there's an atmosphere of peace and trust, resting in his love. We may not get up from our knees with the exact answer to prayer that we, we asked for or that we wanted, but we do come from the presence of God in the process of being healed, refreshed and invigorated with the calm assurance that he has our best interest at heart. Consider the power of intercessory prayer. In Corinthians 1.9, Paul says, For this reason we also do not cease praying for you, and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And we find throughout Paul's letters to the Galatians, Ephesians, Corinthians, etc., that he's constantly saying, we're praying for you, we're praying for you. Intercessory prayer has always been part of the Christian community, but now the scientific community is paying attention as well. In fact, some doctors have, have actually um, come up with some tests to, um, to try and, and, and test this and, and um, prove whether or not prayer makes a difference. And some of them are convinced that prayer can significantly improve a patient's health. That same Reader's Digest article that we mentioned before reported on one such study that was conducted by a Dr Robert Bird at San Francisco General Hospital in 1996. It was a double-blind study. That is, neither the medical staff nor the patients knew that they were being prayed for, knew about the prayers. Because the mind can release positive chemical endorphins that enable the body to heal itself, Dr Bird wanted to be sure this wasn't a factor in this study. He chose 400 patients who, had had, who were having or about to have coronary bypass surgery and wrote down their details and handed them to church members around San Francisco and um, asked them to pray for these specific patients. Um, that was half the the 400, um, yeah, half the people were to be prayed for, the other half weren't. Um, the results were indisputable. The prayed for group, which remember had no knowledge of the prayers, recovered more quickly than the unprayed for group. They had fewer complications and needed less medication. All this research leads to the conclusion that if, from a purely scientific point of view, Something happens when we pray that doesn't happen if we don't pray. Now, I, I understand that some of you may have some legitimate concerns about this type of research. I must admit um, I'm not entirely comfortable with it myself. But the fact does remain that the medical literature seems to provide some evidence that prayer makes a difference. Former, former It Is Written speaker, Mark Finley, tells an amazing story of intercessory prayer. 
that began way back in 1946 when Pastor and Mrs Paul Boynton um, began a term of mission service in, in Iran. Pastor Boynton was called to be the principal and Bible teacher at um, a church-run English language school there in Tehran. One of his students was Ludmilla, a Russian girl, 16-year-old Ludmilla. Ludmilla took a real interest in um, Pastor Boynton's Bible classes and, and she really enjoyed the worship services they had at the school, particularly the music. She had a flair for languages and a beautiful soprano singing voice and she quickly memorised the, the, the English words for her favourite hymn that they sang at the, at, in worship, I Come to the Garden Alone. Um, Ludmilla commenced Bible studies with Pastor Boynton, but before she could make a decision for baptism, her father was called back to Moscow with his work. As Pastor Boynton farewelled Ludmilla, he encouraged her to keep up her studies and he made her promise that if things ever relaxed in Russia to the point where Christian churches could come in and that the, if the Adventists came in to run a mission that she would attend. He also made her a promise that he would pray for her. He kept that promise, not for a year, not for 10 years, not for 20 years, but for 47 years. For 47 years he prayed for Ludmilla daily by name. He often thought of that young Russian girl and wondered where she was in that vast country with its 11 time zones. Had the, the spark that had been planted in her heart way back then there in Tehran grown or had it been extinguished by the hard, cold realities of atheistic communism? Decades passed. And in 1993, and this is where Mark Finley comes into the story, the Iron Curtain had finally come down and Pastor Finley was invited to go to Moscow to run a series of evangelistic meetings. One night, about halfway through the series, a, a tall, well-dressed woman came to the front of the auditorium at the end of the, of the meeting and introduced herself to Mark and asked in perfect English, asked him if he knew Pastor Paul Boynton. She told Mark the story of how Pastor Boynton had introduced her to Jesus all those years ago in Tehran. Mark had to admit that he, he'd never met, he didn't know Pastor Boynton, but they chatted for a while and before she left he got Ludmilla to write her name and address on a piece of paper. And they they agreed that they would catch up again um, during, before the end of the series, um, after the meetings each night. But an unexpected illness prevented Ludmilla from attending the rest of the, of the meetings and Paul, um, Mark and his team left Moscow without catching up with Ludmilla again. Several months passed and Mark and some of his uh, it, is, it Is Written team were in Orlando, Florida, visiting with um, supporters of the program and as was their custom whether they were back at, at their headquarters or whether they were out on the road meeting with financial supporters of the program a different member of the team did the morning worship each morning and this particular morning the the team member who was scheduled to take worship that morning came to Mark to Mark and said uh, that her old high school Bible teacher was there and would it be all right if um, she asked him to do the morning worship? Mark said, of course, that'd be fine. And you can imagine his surprise when Pastor Paul Boynton was introduced to take the worship. Well, Mark couldn't wait, of course, for the worship to be over so that he could speak to, to Paul. And as soon as the worship had finished, he went to Paul and he said, I know something about you. And Paul sort of looked a bit worried, you know, what does he know about me? Um, he said, I know you were a missionary in Iran. And Paul said, yeah, that's right, that's true. He said, I know you taught at the English language school there. 
Yes, that's true. He said, I know one of your students was Lud Miller. And well, Mark thought, says he thought um, Paul was going to pick him up and throw him in, throw him in the air. And um, Mark filled Paul in on how he'd met Lud Miller in, at these meetings he was running in, in Moscow. And Mark was actually due to return to Moscow uh, a couple of months later to run another series of meetings. Um, but unfortunately, he'd lost that slip of paper with Lud Miller's address on it. And um, he went back to Russia but was not, not able to catch up with Ludmilla to contact her. After he, he returned back to the States and a, a month or two after he returned, uh, his associate speaker, at, it is written, um, Royce Williams, was due to fly to Moscow to run some follow-up meetings. And they decided that they needed to make that slip of paper a matter of prayer. And two days, two days before Royce was to fly out to Moscow, Mark found that slip, slip of paper crumpled in the back of a drawer. They had no way of knowing, of course, until Royce got to Moscow and made some inquiries whether um, what had happened to Ludmilla in the months since Mark had met her. Had she moved from that address? Had the illness that had prevented her from attending the rest of the meetings been fatal? They didn't know. When Royce arrived in, in Moscow, at the first opportunity he had, he, he found this address on this bit of paper and knocked on the door, but there was no answer. He called back several times, but again, no one home. So he wrote a little note with his phone number and put it under the door. And a couple of days later, he got a phone call from Ludmilla's son, who'd been keeping an eye on his mother's house while she was away, to say that his mother was in, in the States, in the United States, visiting friends. These friends um, that Ludmilla was visiting lived in Los Angeles, and wait for it, just a few kilometres from the It Is Written headquarters. Um, Royce, of course, at the first, first chance he got, rang Mark back in the States to tell Mark that Ludmilla was there in Los Angeles, and Mark arranged a reunion between Pastor Boynton and Ludmilla at the Thousand Oaks Church. Paul Boynton, Mark and Ludmilla both spoke and shared their parts of this, this amazing story. And Mark says that there was, not, there was hardly a dry eye in the church when Ludmilla gave her talk and she, she spoke at the end about a small English New Testament that a fellow student at the school had given her before she left Russia, before she left Tehran to return to Russia, and how this little Bible had slipped through the border checks unnoticed and how she'd kept it hidden for all these years. Then... Ludmilla stepped to the microphone and sang that beautiful song that she had learned as a, as a 16 year old in Tehran all those years ago. I come to the garden alone. You know, I'm glad that Paul Boynton's understanding of prayer was different to Huck Finn's. For 47 years, Pastor Boynton prayed for Ludmilla, believing all the time that God would somehow work it out. Answers to prayer don't always come, don't always happen in the time frame that we would like. Answers to prayer don't always happen in the manner that we would like. But answers to prayer do happen. Sometimes it may even take 47 years. In closing, I'd like you to stand with me and sing that beautiful hymn that Ludmilla learned in Tehran as a 16-year-old and then sang at that reunion, I Come to the Garden Alone. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you that you are a God who cares for us, who, a God who is concerned with all aspects of our lives, the big things and the little things. Thank you that we have a God who hears and answers prayers.
And Father, we, we've been reminded this morning that, um, that you may not always answer our prayers in the, the time frame or in the manner that we would like, that we would choose, but we do know that you do answer, that you have our best interests at heart, and we ask for faith to trust you and to let you work things out in your own good time. Thank you for loving us enough to die for us. Thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you and help us in this week ahead, Father, to um, take the opportunities that we have to share what we've found in you with others around us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.